Okay. Yeah, hello, thank, thank you for coming. This is the last session of the day. Um, my name is Matei, and today I want to take you to an island in the Pacific Ocean where you will find the Tropolis, uh, the city of Retropolis. And right there in the middle, over there, is the Retropolis Academy of Art. And this is a school I'm designing. And it's a bit of an unconventional school because it actually lives completely inside of a video game. Uh, and video games called Pixel Art Academy, and this is my master's project. Um, and maybe even more unconventional, given that this is an educational video game, is that it's actually, uh, my learners are actually mostly adults. And the reason why that is, is because uh, pixel art, which is this art style that you're seeing right here, this looks kind of like old video games. Um, and a lot of people that want to learn pixel art, uh, they want to learn it to create, create their own video games. So they're kind of like my age. Um, and this is, so if they learn pixel art, or just art in general, they will be able to go from something like this to something more like this. And it almost looks like a different game, but if you kind of pay attention, you see that it's the same thing. And this is what we call programmer art. This is when you have a coder that doesn't have art skills yet, uh, and we'll just use these kind of placeholders, and then by the end they would put real graphics in to come to this. And so if they learn this, basically is trying to get one step closer to realizing their dream, basically, of making a video game. Um, so these programmers, they have great technical skills, but there's this problem, and every child is an artist, but it's a problem how to remain an artist once we grow up. And somewhere along the way, they will tell you that art is a talent, and that some people have it, some people don't. And they will also tell you things like that there's this inherent intelligence um, that is the major cause of your achievements. Um, and the researchers have shown that this is actually harmful. And if anything else, research shows in psychology and neuroscience that the opposite is true, that we can increase our intellectual ability by, uh, with effort. And this is called growth mindset. And drawing is just another skill. And this is what I'm advocating a lot, uh, being a learner of drawing myself. And people really shouldn't be stopped you know, if they want to learn something like art, by myths about talent. And so, I wanted to make a course that's not going to be intimidating if you want to learn something like this. And so, that's why I'm creating Pixar Art Academy um, and the Retropolis Academy of Art. Anyone that wants to learn art can learn art. And so, in this talk, I wanted to take you, I wanted to show you how I designed this video game uh, for learning how to draw, and it's based on learning theories, because that's kind of why we're here. Um, and mainly it's based on the theories about around self-directed and self-regulated learning. And just to kind of place that in context, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so, hi again. My name is Matei Jan. Um, this is how I would look like on the weekends <laughs> as a kid. Um, on the weekends, uh, my parents would allow me two hours of video game time. They were very strict about that. Um, but that didn't stop us. Like, me and my brother, we would love video games. We actually also started making them, and we both ended up being game developers as adults. So it's kind of like a parenting tip. If you, if you want your kids to become something, just take that thing, limit their time down to the minute, minimum, which really drives you crazy guaranteed results. <laughs> so this is how this would look like in practice. This is how like the video games would look like in practice. Um, this is a game called Contraband. It was uh, about smuggling computers out of Western Europe back to Yugoslavia where I grew up. <laughs> and I know like here you're not the biggest fans of the regime I grew up with, but we did some things right. And this was a kid's magazine I used to read in elementary school. And you can see that there were like a couple of pages dedicated to learning how to code. And notice we couldn't even read lowercase letters yet, <sighs> but we would type this in just to see that, you know, uh, sailboat or, uh, up here and something like that. And this is how we would actually eventually learn how to go. So given our interest in video games and having these resources for how to make them, we would eventually learn uh, how to code and how to draw. And so taking this initiative to learn, you know, to, to choose what you want to do, where you're going to find these resources, and then like learning strategies 
this is the essence of what we call self-directed learning. And so this is how I learned pixel art, and I do it to this day. These are some of my works. This takes about 200 hours <laughs> to make. Um, and somewhere along the line, in three years ago, actually, 2003, I made this video about how to how to make how to get started with pixel art, how to use drawing software, and it got semi-popular, has a, over 100,000 views, and there's a lot of other videos like this, like this is kind of the tip of the iceberg of pixel art. So it's a big thing in gaming, it's kind of niche, but in that space it's pretty relevant. And I think this video has 100,000 views because, like me, other people have interests of making video games, and so when they get these kind of resources, they go on to learn uh, just kind of naturally. And so that's how I came to Stanford. I was going to make a successor to my video, like a more coherent course, bring all the resources from the internet kind of together. And I created Pixel Art Academy, the Getting Started Guide, which I want to show you right now. And so it would be like an online course. It had, it would teach you, you know, it would take you from the basics and then to more advanced stuff and it will give you assignments that you have to do and resources where you learn this from. And this is what my students ended up with. Um, so it's not the world's biggest, greatest pixel art yet, but I showed them in one week that you know you can get your foot in the door. And I also wanted to show them a little bit of the growth mindset. And so I showed them this, uh, this guy, he's pretty, he's pretty young, I think he's 17. Peter Armstead, and he started on the left, which is kind of where I brought you know my students to. But then I showed him that in one year he could go from the left to the right by studying other people and practicing. And so when people saw this, the responses I got from somebody said, "Man, I'll I'll get there someday." You know, they could envision themselves becoming mm -hmm. that. And another one said, "I'll try to practice at least some minutes every day." So they saw that you know it's effort. If they put in effort, they will get there. Um, I was also using uh, the fog behavior model <laughs> that I was actually introduced by Chris at one of Chris Bennett's uh, workshops. And this breaks down uh, behavior down to motivation and ability and shows that you can either have, you need high motivation or it, the behavior needs to be easy to do for, for it to happen. So if you're in this green area, when I will ask you to practice, for example, you will do it. So I spent, when I was preparing this material, uh, quite some time to make it as easy as possible to simplify it so that I would bring as many you know into the section area and this also worked somebody said I completed the full seven days mainly because the exercises were in small chunks and so yay great we're done um, except things are usually this simple um, so it turns out that by making this course trying to teach pixel art um, I actually came to the real problem. <clears throat> and the real problem is, so this study that I did was with about 400 people. Um, and every day of this course, some of them would drop out. Mm -hmm. And so by the end, I was left with a quarter of the students. So it's kind of like if you're a teacher, you have a classroom, and every day, one out of five students just doesn't show up. They gave up. Um, so it was kind of like, I don't know, when I see this, it's kind of, it, it hurts because there are people that want to learn something, they have the resources, but they, they didn't complete them. The, what's maybe the saddest part that this 25% is actually considered a very good thing in online learning. This is data from Coursera and EDX, where things in reality are more close to 10%. Um, so, you know, what's going on there? And so I ask, you know, they have... They have the interest, they have the resources, why isn't this happening? Like self-directed learning was letting me down, there's nothing going on over there. And so I asked uh, the participants in the study, and it turns out that the biggest obstacle is time. And people say, I couldn't finish because uh, life just got real busy, and this one's my favorite. I started slacking off after day four, this is due to my proficiency in procrastination. <laughs> so, and other things they would say is, you know, motivation falls when it's, it's tried hard to get through hard parts. Uh, they didn't have a plan, if they were kind of aimless, or they lacked self-discipline and couldn't, you know, keep up with the schedule. And notice one thing is that none of these things 
actually have to do with there not being enough learning resources or there's not mm -hmm. enough you know good learning resources what I actually have to do is with students ability to do self-regulated learning and if self-directed learning is I have some interest some need and I'm gonna learn for that self-regulated learning is having the skills to then put that learning into action and as we saw it turns out that most people don't have that they didn't learn it and so this is where I realized that my work here won't be so much about creating the learning resources. It needs to be a little bit more fundamental. Um, for, for what I envisioned, I see that I need to create a learning environment itself that is, based, that is specialized for self-directed, self-regulated learning. So it needs to be kind of embedded within so that I will bring the students from a place where they're supported by the environment and give them the skills until they can use them on their own. And so this is how Pixel Art Academy actually looks like. I wanted to take you for a little tour. Um, the story will start in a dorm room at the Retropolis Academy of Art. Uh, and you as the player will be helping this art student get through. And so, so this is kind of this kind of how it looks like. It's a point and click adventure. And what's great about this genre, it's an old genre, but it has one important thing for me is that you as the player are actually interacting with this protagonist in the story. And so the interface in itself has this built-in interaction. Uh, you're giving instruction to the player. And this is important because of it enables the protege effect, which is kind of the concept that students will actually learn better when they're trying to teach another character to do it. Um, so as you're trying to teach your character this Time or time uh, time organization strategies. You're basically learning them for yourself, and so you end up doing a schedule for yourself. At what times will it be best for you to to do this? You know, to, to participate in the game. And so here I return to fog behavior model uh, because just like in self-directed learning, it's apparently not enough that you have uh, the need, the interest, and the resources. It's also not enough to just have motivation and make things as simple as possible. You also need a trigger, something that will prompt you to do that. And so basically as you've designed this schedule, what you told me is when is going to be a good time for you when your ability will be highest. And so at that time I can send you an email, send you a reminder, a notification showing you, hey, this is what's going on with my character, or I'll give you some kind of a prompt that you would look you would go back into the game and re-engage with the player. And so now you have this character, and you come out of your dorm room, and the first thing you'll notice is that you are in this sci-fi city of Metropolis. And here I really wanted to capture your imagination, get you immersed into this world, and just bring you somewhere into a world that's full of different interesting possibilities. And here I'm following the four-phase model of interest development. And without going into too much detail over these four phases, uh, the important part for me is that it tells us how to design activities that will bring you from a place where you're supported by extrinsic motivators and to intrinsic, where you're, uh, where you're able to self-sustain your interest. Uh, and this is kind of crucial for self-regulated learning, right? Because at this point, you will be in control of your learning. And so the way this works in my video game is that you will go around the school campus and you will meet different interest groups like game developers, fine artists, crafters, and they will give you from these little small, very direct act activities to do, project-based learning. And then as you progress through that interest storyline, you will come all the way uh, to more long-term collaborative projects with others. And so one example of this is the game development storyline where you meet this game developer and she wants you to develop art for her game. <laughs> and so first of all, you can look at how that game looks like at the start. And it's this snake kind of game. And at the start, you're just a green snake eating these brown squares. It's programmer art like I've showed you. So here I go into the drawing app. Um, and I will first, so it shows you the list of sprites that you have to work with. And so here I will just draw some patterns on the snake. 
and then I will go to the apple part, I mean to the food part, <laughs> and I will kind of take the red color and, you know, try to turn it into an apple. Not that I know why snakes eat apples, but... <laughs> um, so this would kind of look like this. And the great part now, this is the <coughs> crucial part, now when you go back into the game, the mm -hmm. artwork is immediately replaced, and you're able to see what you just drew in the video game. So this is our striped little snake, and there's our little mm -hmm. apple. And this is a very important component of andragogy, mm -hmm. which is kind of which focuses on education for adults. But most quickly found out that it's actually not just it doesn't just work for adults; it works for everyone. It's generalizable to all self-directed learning, and because self-directed learning is a very proactive thing, then also learning needs to be a very active thing. Like, you want to learn by doing, that's the ideal in, in andragogy. And it's kind of like the saying, uh, you know, how it's show, don't tell. Here it's do, don't show. So, and games are all about that. It's kind of the, the medium, you know, it's, you know, you have, before that you have books, you have theater, or you have lectures like right now. You can watch a video. These are all passive mediums. Games and video games are the one where you are, you actually need to learn through doing. And so this is how this looks like, right? You get the, you start with the goal, like for example, do the art for the snake. But at that point, you are presented with a choice. Either you can just go straight to the action and then see, you know, what you need to learn and then get feedback and then maybe revise. But other people feel more comfortable if they first get their uh, learning materials and you know and kind of be prepared into it and this is all uh, this kind of agency is crucial uh, in the self-directed learning model this is where this is based on and, and Garrison says that you know as teachers we are in this kind of model we're preparing the resources and giving feedback to to our students but it's actually the students who are choosing their goals and they need to be choosing when they, when and how they will use their learning materials. And so the game still gives you, this was kind of my initial plan to bring all these resources together, the game gives you that, but it's way more in kind of just-in-time learning metaphor here. And the game will also always give you this kind of next steps of what to do, uh, what's new happening in the world, something, you know, you will have new goals to choose, new resources to look up, you want to keep players in the loop. <laughs> and so here I refer to a uh, work that was introduced by Chris Bennett on game, on game design. And so, you know, you now you, when you're done with the Apple, how can you improve it? So you learn lighting theory, for example, and you put highlights on and you put shadows and reflected light, stuff like that. And then when you run the game, you know, it's even better. And then the game developer will come back to you and give you, oh, so you started with the snake and the food, and now it gives you, oh, let's put obstacles in. And this will constantly iterate, and so as you, as the game grows, you basically grow with it, um, and your art skills with it. The last two things I want to talk about are based more on the social components, because uh, we don't learn in a vacuum, and Levin Wenger uh, nicely introduced us to this concept, how we go into communities of practice, we start as newcomers and slowly move to, towards the center where the masters are. And in Pixar Academy, you actually see how others are solving their assignments. Mm. And so here you're slowly moving from a newcomer learning from others to the place where, you, where others are learning from you. And in my prototype that I have online, this is exactly what's going on. Students are asking questions and others are responding, and there's this exchange of information going on. And here, there's a lot of uh, research, new research, it's pretty modern, um, on personal, personal learning environments, because this is, a, and this one specifically describes how we use online tools for, to help self-directed learning. It's basically, it's research written for me personally. Um, so I look at, it, look at it a lot. And the main kind of thing is that, that I get from here is, People, it needs to be focused on user-generated content. So that's why you have to have this interaction with players. Players need to put out their artwork. This needs to be front and center. 
and I know that you're seeing these Oreos and there's going to be lunch soon, so I'm going to stop here. I did use a lot of uh, research and feedback as well. Um, and I know the project has taken a couple of turns, but this snake example for, was very, was actually uh, tested and was received really well when people see that interaction of seeing, you know, immediate results. So if you're around at four, you're very welcome to try this prototype out. And other designs are still yet to be tested to see if they work as well in practice as they do in learning theory. And so, and this is my exciting part now for me. And in fall, we're going to start with 800 students. There's a lot of really good um, interest. And then in winter, if everything goes fine, we're going to add 2,000 more. And so I just want to close with a quote from my favorite lifelong learner. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. And this kind of really sums up self-regulated learning and in the sense that Aspirations are not enough, it's the skills of being able to follow through with them that will enable us to learn things. So, thank you very much. Thank you to all people that supported me this year. Um, thank you for all to who have been in this room, and I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been following your work a lot this year, and so I don't have questions about that. It's been really impressive to, to watch. I also don't have questions about whether you want to scale, because I know that you're already doing that. Uh, what do you see are your big obstacles as you as you are scaling? And it becomes, and, and it's going more, less personal and it's starting to scale it out. Yeah, so, well, first of all, the development itself is the kind of, I am the bottom right now, and school has taken a lot of my time, so it's not as developed as I would like it to. Um, so that's one thing, you know, just like the technical side dealing with servers and especially because I have so big demand, right? Right now you have about a hundred people using the alpha and then it's going to be 800. So I hope that I won't be spending too much time in just trying to get the technical stuff out, but that I can actually focus on these kind of issues. Um, so for the, I don't know, like the fa we have a Facebook group that has 400 people in it, and it's always nice to see how, how people help each other. So I'm not super worried about, I don't know, like that everyone will, you know, rely on my feedback to them. There's so many others that are willing to do, and that's how all the communities of practice so far have, that's exactly how everything's worked so far. So I think on that note, I can, you know, rely on that. And other than that, it's just creating new content, new bringing new things for them to do, and hopefully to. Cool. Oh, one, one more suggestion, real quick, is um, I know keeping the engagement going, as, as you showed there, can, can be tough. Um, I've been finding that the that the social equation can really add a lot to engagement, especially over the middle long term. Social. The, the social engagement, and which you showed with people giving people giving feedback. I'll be really interested to see you do some experiments around there and, and gather some data around there to see where you can make the biggest, see if you can make the biggest jumps there. Yeah, and it's been great seeing this year, um, inspired by people like me, to just how much you can also do in just prototypes and put this content out, quickly test it, and like the this 400 people study, that's amazing. Like, as much as it worked great, there's also so many people that have giving me, oh, this point, this step is too hard. So there's, yeah, so I definitely collect points on all that. And it's a video game. It's very easy, at least embedding, you know, all these kind of points. So yeah, okay. Wow. I thought this was terrific. Um, so as I've gotten to know you since, you know, you were in my class and so on, my expectations for you go higher and higher. So I came in expecting a lot, and you went beyond that. So I thought this was just great. On a presentation perspective, I thought the pacing was very good, and there was this great kind of narrative arc, and it was just, it was very compelling. So just being able to craft this experience well, I think you did good. Just, it was fun. Uh, kind of on a bigger picture, there seems to be, and this is a compliment, a real integrity, and I don't mean honesty, I mean a unity to your work, like who you are and what's driving you, and even just down to the little selections and choices on the slide. So there's really something very compelling about that. 
and it comes together as a real strength. I mean, it just this is just like super pro. If you're out in industry giving this, people would be. I mean, this is great work. I think from uh, from that perspective, I'm trying really hard to find something to critique <laughs> you on, uh, and maybe there's just one thing: uh, the attrition problem. Did this solve the attrition problem? That is yet to be tested. That's okay. one big thing that I am super uh, excited to see if we can get above 25. Although, update us. I thought this was yeah. a really great. I'll think harder about yeah. things to I, critique on, but just, I mean, overall, I just I wish I was terrific. there, and yeah, since taking other classes and really wanting to get the best of this one-year experience here, I'm not as far, but I am confident because now I know <laughs> I will go full-time into this. So, I have time, so uh, those answers will come. Okay. <laughs> just, just to reinforce that. Sure. Uh, yes. I mean, I'm not, not, not being familiar with your work at all, but I, I agree. The thing that came across to me was authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, passion, mm -hmm. uh, and, and belief, and a very, very sound theoretical understanding of learning theory and uh, game space learning theory and things like that. So I think those, those are the particular strengths. I think the issue about retention, I mean, there are a lot of MOOC providers who would be very happy with the 25% per retention rate. <laughs> yeah. <they>? yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the challenges will be about scalability and sustainability. Yeah, I hope I can address that. And hopefully scaling also the development with this and the game is having pre-orders now as well so hopefully the money part will catch up because people are super interested I'm like kind of floored of hey here's an educational game because educational games don't have the biggest uh, yeah. reputation especially when you call them entertainment so this tries to be a video game first and then kind of embed everything else yeah I thought the attention to I'll call it the social emotional side of, of this kind of learning was really interesting and I think you can make that even more visible in, in the project. A um, lot of research and, and even citing some of that research that you now know about, making that available to these learners who are going to be using this. Um, we did a project uh, that connects to this a couple of years ago at the Institute for the Future, if you know these guys across in Palo Alto. Uh, it was called Extreme Learners. We tried. To, we were interested in this question about there are people out here who just love to learn. And you're, you're an extreme, I, you are an extreme learner. So if you go to that website, you'll see we made some video interviews with about a dozen of them. Oh. They range in age from like 9 to 60. But these are folks, and actually the one, the one kid that we wanted, I call him a kid, we wanted an interview had been featured on Salon or something. His name is Feynman Leon. He's got a great name, Feynman Leon. And of course, the first question is, was he named after... Richard and yes, yes, his parents named. Anyway, he was he was profiled as a, a college student who um, had taken the most MOOCs, dozens of them, when he was in college, and so they interviewed him. And we wanted to interview him. He was not available. Um, but what's interesting about these extreme learners is exactly the, the point you made about time. Their time management. So when you go through the list of their attributes, they love to learn. Of course, they're self-directed but their time management skills, something as practical as that, they actually make time and don't do other things in order to make time for the thing that they're passionate about. Feynman, for instance, when all the other kids are out Friday uh, at, at pretty soon out having happy hour, he's in his dorm room taking a MOOC because he just loves to learn. So he foregoes a lot of that kind of stuff that college students go through in order. So making those trade-offs, making that more visible to people, saying, if you want to do this, yeah. Here's the amount of time it's going to take. You're going to have problems. You're going to have, you know, failures. And here's what we'll do to support that. Yeah, and there's a lot of. Um, I got a lot of good information from. Uh, there's this uh, art teacher that has a design school in Singapore, and his he compares. He did this podcast. He compares why uh, how that you can learn on your own, but he also compares all the strengths that you get when you go to art school. And the mm -hmm. biggest one is that type time commitment that you're putting in. Yeah. So if you're really serious, you can do it on your own, but you also have to be as serious on those commitments. Yeah. And uh, there was another research that, um, for self-regulated learning where they go over it, and they say specifically that that it's these intentions that they have to learn, for most people, they are not very well protected from other, other you know, uh, competing goal tendencies that they have. 
So yeah, go watch Netflix instead of that. So I mean, here it's almost to some part we're trying to trick people into you know using those kind of mechanics that you have to keep people engaged, like on slot machines almost, you know. But it's like you're trying to use those same strategies to help them actually do what they want to do, right? And the thing is, I want to be very transparent with that, so I like that suggestion. Because every time I'm using something, you know, hey, behavior design is going on. You're going to see that in a small little card that you can also then read and get that research. That's kind of my... Oh, good. Like in, in BJ's class, we had to kind of find, uh, formalize our kind of ethical uh, side approach to uh, to behavior design, especially because, you know, you are changing people, how people are working, right? So one of mine was definitely transparency. Mm -hmm. Like, I want you to choose what you want to do and then allow me, okay, so help me do this and here's what we're going to do. Great. Sure. Thank you. So I'm just a visitor today and, and had read your um, summary before coming in to be a reviewer today. And I thought, gosh, why is this guy using pixel art? It seems so primitive. Uh, maybe Slovenia doesn't have Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, but having seen the presentation, I just wanted to echo the comments of, of what an amazing uh, uh, amount of thought went into your uh, project and, and how you balance such sophisticated learning theory with this unsophisticated art. So I just wanted to compliment you with that all that passion and and the strength of your uh, thoughts really come out in spite of uh, pixel art, which uh, I guess I'm having trouble with. But uh, I'm just curious, as, as students progress through this, are, are, you know, what level does it go up and does it get from less sophisticated into more sophisticated or is that what you meant to show with some of the, you know, the more dramatic drawings? Uh, yeah, so it, there's definitely, I would give you just a small little pushback on that. <laughs> pixel art is it's a niche thing, but it is becoming very well sophisticated. Actually, I have a couple of slides that I think I went one minute over time anyway already, so I had to cut stuff out. But what I was also going to show you, and this is exactly your answering your question, so why do, why do people like pixel art? Why am I fascinated with pixel art? Sure, there's this component. We grew up in the 80s and 90s, and this was just the way games were because the hardware limitations were like that. But the thing is, now when we see this is a modern pixel art game, when you see this, it just gives you this warm feeling inside. Like it, tra it has this ability to tra transport you back into the time when you were a kid. You were carefree, and all you cared was, you know, to play. Um, and it's a very powerful thing, and pe that's why people want to learn. And also have so, for example, even though pixel art died, it, there's a great, you know, right on the rise, in particular because of independent game developers. That kind of that are my age now and realize this trend. So, and there's a lot of artists that don't just care about uh, game art. They just take it as fine art. There's like create illustrations and there's some amazing stuff. Like yeah, the mind mind works are like this big, almost like fine wall of things of so many things going on. But there's others that you know push it into a very more like fine art direction. So there's a lot of more in the pixel art community than I could show you know. Well, good pushback and, and very good presentation. Thank you. So on that note, I'm going to say thank you. Mm -hmm.